centuries, humankind regarded the oceans as an inexhaustible source of fish, crab and shrimp. Then we began trying to manage them with regulations and quotas. But the data compiled by scientists leaves little room for interpretation. These measures will not suffice to prevent the collapse of fish stocks. More and more species are threatened with extinction. More and more ecosystems are threatened with destruction. And it is humankind who will suffer in the end. is a valuable source of nutrition, rich in protein, healthy fats, vitamins and iodine. And fish is never boring. Fish is so much more diverse than meat. You can serve it with cream sauce or with butter sauce, you can poach it with lemon, cook it with fat or without, you can practically cook it any way you like. Fish is dankbar für jede Zubereitung. Of the 16,764 species of fish in our oceans, humankind uses several thousand for food. For more than a billion people, fish is the most important source of animal protein. Fish is, fish is a pure product of nature. There's nothing synthetic about it. It's something noble, something that ought to be treated with respect. We have to be aware that a fish has sacrificed its life for us. And in return, we have to treat this product with respect, try to use it sparingly, and make something good of it. Europe's biggest fish market still promises everlasting plenty. There's hardly a fish you can't buy here. Many consumers have gradually become aware of the crisis facing our oceans, but few take it as seriously as Jean-Claude Bardo. For example, I would never buy tuna fish. I'd be reluctant to buy skate. Tuna is an endangered species, so we can go without that. And skate is a fish that produces only about 100 to 150 young per year. That's nothing compared to the 100,000 eggs laid by a mackerel. So we should treat fish like this sparingly. There are alternatives. Shoppers here can still choose between more than a hundred types of fish and shellfish. Behind these scenes of plenty is a well-oiled and finely tuned machine that, for the moment, still makes sure the fish keep coming. The goods come from the Atlantic, the North Sea, the Mediterranean and the Pacific and from the Northern and Southern Hemispheres, from tropical and subtropical waters. What counts here is speed, quantity and turnover. Every year, about 150 million tons of fish are consumed around the world. About one and a half times as much as pork, for example. Scientific studies have shown that some 80% of all fish stocks have been exploited to their biological limits or beyond. Researchers will be left to find out what effects all this will have on our oceans. My entire life has revolved around the sea, but I still try to spend as much time as possible in or on the sea. I used to only do field experiments. I was always outdoors conducting field experiments, and that put me in direct contact with nature.
The marine biologist Boris Wurm has spent more than 10 years analysing how large-scale fishing changes the oceans. My focus changed because of an experience I had 10 years ago in the field. I noticed that every part of the food web I examined had been changed by humans. It starts with plants and goes all the way up to birds, whales and big fish. And I thought, we have no understanding of what effects we are actually having. Dramatic effects of fishing do not become apparent until the data are compiled from all oceanic regions. This is why Boris Wurm has collected catch data from all over the world for several decades, along with the detailed results of other marine biologists' research. At the end of this piecemeal work, an overall picture of the state of the oceans emerges. And the results are alarming. Since the 1950s, catches worldwide have increased fivefold. In the same space of time, the amount of fish in the sea has been reduced by half, especially in coastal regions, but also on the high seas and even in the depths of the oceans. Increasing numbers of fish species are being exploited to an ever-growing extent. Some 15% of fish stocks are on the verge of total collapse, and many more are headed the same way. The consequence for our ecosystem is that species can no longer fully play their ecological role. For example, if a predator fish no longer controls the population of its prey and in turn their numbers explode. Marine biologist Bob Scheibling is examining just such a phenomenon, the sea urchins off the coast of Canada. Their greatest natural enemies are predators like cod. But cod stocks off the Canadian coast have collapsed since the mid-1990s, after decades of overfishing. And they have yet to recover in this region. As a result, the population of sea urchins has exploded. This has drastic effects on the coastal ecosystem. So, so kelp beds are remarkably rich and productive ecosystems. They've been likened to the rainforests of, mm -hmm. of the sea. They certainly look like it. Normally, the entire coast is overgrown with kelp beds. You can see these tremendous aggregations of urchins just, just weighing down the kelp and consuming all of the kelp. Overfishing has brought about the collapse of an entire ecosystem. Many more oceanic ecosystems are threatened with the same fate. In the course of my work, I have been surprised time and again by how global these changes are. If we look at different oceanic regions, such as the North Sea, the waters off Africa, the middle of the Pacific, we see similar changes because people behave more or less the same in all these places. This is very worrying. Meantime, many states have begun trying to control the negative impact of overfishing. In European waters, the European Union lays down rules and quotas. In Germany, the Federal Agency for Agriculture and Nutrition tries to make sure these rules are observed. Three fisheries protection vessels patrol the North and Baltic Sea for fishing boats breaking the law. If we gave up carrying out checks, we would be going back to the early 1980s, when overfishing was rampant. We can see this in other parts of the world. Some of the things that go on are incredible. I think the inspections we carry out and just our presence in the North Sea are invaluable. Inspectors are ship's officers with additional qualifications as fisheries inspectors. They conduct up to 880 checks a year in the North Sea alone.
list of regulations they have to make sure are being upheld is impressive. The number of days the fishermen can spend at sea is regulated, as is the size of the fishing boat and its engines. And, of course, a fisherman has to stay within his quota for any particular type of fish. There are precise rules governing the types of nets a fisherman can use and the size of the mesh. For sole and place, for example, the mesh must be between 80 to 90 millimetres wide. If the mesh is too small, young fish get caught up in them before they reach reproductive maturity. This has an exponentially negative effect on fish stocks. In the call room, the inspectors look for species for which the fisherman has no license or quota. In this case, cod would be an infringement. They also check that the fish aren't smaller than the minimum size allowed. The minimum length is 27 centimetres. We can see this fish is more than 27 centimetres long, so it's OK. However, the strict rules only apply to catches brought ashore by the fishermen. What they catch at sea is irrelevant. But that is exactly what counts when it comes to protecting the oceans. At the moment, fishermen may catch many, many fish that they don't even bother to count because they are not interested in them. They are not allowed to keep fish for which they have no quota or which have yet to reach the minimum size, even if they could theoretically sell them. And if they are not allowed to sell them, they don't want them. They throw back soles, starfish, crabs, mussels, dabs, and most of them are dead already. All the same, this fisherman has not broken any rules. There was 85% bycatch, which had to go back overboard. There's nothing we can do about that. That's the way the laws are. They have a certain mesh size, and there's nothing we can do about the bycatch, nothing at all. I think that's terrible. It's as if a farmer had a herd of pigs and he killed and buried 85 of them and only brought 15 to market. I think it's absolutely awful. and regulations for fisheries are formulated far away from the coast. Maria Damanaki, who has been European Commissioner for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries since 2010, is one of those fighting for sustainable fishing policies. The Commission has had some success, notably the banning of what's known as high grading. It's the worst uh, form of discards. And that's the worst form because um, if we're talking about high grading, then the man, the fisherman, the man, destroys uh, the resources on purpose. You have uh, some fish there, you throw it into the sea just because it's not profitable enough. Some fishermen throw them away to make room for more lucrative fish. That was perfectly legal in the EU until 2008. Ten uh, years ago or 20 years ago, there was a lot of fish in the sea. Eh? So maybe the people then thought that uh, they can afford discards. But now this is not the case anymore because we have less and less fish. We fish more and more. And these practices as high grating, they, they, they give, they give uh, food to this vicious circle of overfishing. We overfish, we throw in the sea, we overfish, and there is no fish left. So we owe this to our children. I'm trying to persuade everybody that uh, we just uh, accept what the scientists tell us about fish and mortality and try to do. To reach sensible decisions, the politicians in Brussels want well-founded assessments of the fish stocks. The 
This is why the EU maintains the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, or ISIS. The committee is made up of several hundred scientists. Based on the data they collect, they formulate recommendations for fishery policies. Christopher Zimmerman is a member of ISIS and knows the limits of this advisory position. Whenever we say the quotas can be raised, everyone says, great, good idea. But if we say the quotas have to be reduced, then people will say, that can't be right, the science is wrong. The scientists have to face the allegation that their recommendations are too cautious, that their research is not thorough enough, that they need a better understanding of the dynamics of the fish stock to determine the necessary quotas. From a scientific point of view, we have to say that our data are sufficient. What we already know is enough to implement sustainable fishery management. The problem from our point of view is that our recommendations are not followed, that quotas are not adapted to the state of the fish stocks. The politicians who support this tendency are in turn supported by the fishing lobby, essentially by the big players in the business, who just want things to stay the way they are. The new commissioner is actually on our side, and the problem actually starts with the Agriculture and Fisheries Council. The people with the real power when it comes to making decisions are the respective ministers of the member states. They're the ones who decide on the quotas. We have all this bargaining uh, with the member states, with the ministers, about uh, how much they are going to fish. And um, it, uh, now it seems that it is a pride for every member state <laughs> to come and negotiate and afterwards uh, get uh, some more. We are talking about uh, big interests here. Eh? In uh, Japan, there was an auction about just a fish, one fish, a bluefin tuna fish. And one piece of fish was sold for 400,000 euros. It's like uh, an enterprise, one fish, an apartment. So we're talking about big prices, we're talking about uh, a lot of money. So things cannot uh, <laughs> change easily. Eh? But we have to realize that there is no other way out because even the people who get this big money, if they are going like this, after two or three years, maybe five years, they will have nothing. Even them, even them, even them, the rich, the millionaires. For many years now, biologists and engineers have been looking for ways to end this destructive exploitation of the seas. They're banking on aquaculture, which has found ways to breed large quantities of fish. The industry is growing rapidly. Almost one in every two fish consumed worldwide comes from aquaculture and its share of the global fish market continues to grow. And the methods are being continuously improved, especially in Europe and North America. Use of medication is strictly regulated, as is the amount of cage space afforded to the fish. That means they stay healthy and don't suffer from stress. All the same, ecologists give the concept of marine aquaculture poor marks. Many of the saltwater fish bred in aquaculture facilities are predators. That means they are high up in the food chain. It's as if we were to breed lions and tigers and catch game from the woods to feed them. There's no sense in that. On land, we have cows and pigs lower down in the food chain. That is not the case with fish farming. That involves catching fish in the wild and feeding them to the predators in the aquaculture farms. To get his fish to grow quickly and reach the required size within a year, the fish farmer must constantly feed his stock. The amount of wild fish in the feed fluctuates with the prices for commodities such as fish meal and fish oil. Wild fish can account for up to 60% of the fish food. The more fish in fish meal and fish oil, the better. It means the fish are fed something similar to what they would eat if they led normal lives as predators. 
It makes for maximum growth and hence maximum profit. Most of the fish meal used in aquaculture comes from South America. Peru is the world's biggest producer. Some 1.5 million tons of fish meal are exported from here every year. About half of it is produced in a single city, 500 kilometers north of Lima. The demand for fish meal from Peru is extremely high all over the world right now. It's rich in proteins, and that makes it very popular on the global market. This market is insatiable. Demand far outstrips what we can produce. About 6 million tons of fish meal a year are sold on the global market. In Peru, it is only produced for a few months a year, when large schools of anchovies migrate along the coast. Then the factories are on the go for 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The fish meal business yields great wealth for a select few, and the region pays a high ecological price. The wastewater from the factories is released back into the sea untreated, complete with fish leftovers, blood and fat. Over decades, this organic waste has settled and built up on the floor of the Bay of Chimpote. The biologists at the Peruvian National Marine Research Institute, IMAPE, are powerless to do anything except document the environmental damage. This smell of sulfur is typical. The sediment on the sea floor is mostly made up of sulfur and methane. We assume that conditions there are devoid of oxygen. We're talking about a contaminated layer of mud ranging from 2 to 8 meters thick. The community of animals living on the sea floor is probably the hardest hit. It's totally impoverished, just like the fish stocks. We used to have various types of grouper and croaker, very fine species, great eating for humans. There used to be plenty of them here and many other species too that weren't regarded first and foremost as food. Now they're all gone because their natural habitat has been destroyed. It's important to make this known and to find a solution. That's the priority. As well as its local repercussions, fish meal production has other, more far-reaching consequences. The 30 million tons of smaller fish processed for fish meal every year are then missing from the food web. Ecological research leaves no doubt about that. This is especially hard on animals whose diets are specialized in these fish, seabirds and marine mammals. Though they might live in nature reserves and other habitats far away from the fish meal factories, they are still in direct competition with the fishing fleets. A cormorant eats about 22,000 anchovies, sardines and herrings in a lifetime. A mature sea lion consumes about 8 kilos a day. And you might say the tip of the food chain is just the tip of the iceberg.
as the decline boy the small fish that are caught on a large scale to make fish meal occupy a key position in the marine food web they play an important role both for the fish they prey on and the fish that prey on them if we take a key species out of the system the entire system suffers on the coast of Namibia for example overfishing of sardines has resulted in a glut of jellyfish of course that's a negative effect Marine aquaculture uses up a lot of fish. That means it's not a solution. One main problem is that farming predator fish consumes more fish than it produces. Often it takes two to five kilograms of wild fish to produce a single kilo of farmed fish, sometimes even more. That may take some of the fishing pressure off the bigger predators, but it adds to the pressure on the prey. And this does not lead to an improvement in the situation. It exacerbates the problem of overfishing. Not all fish are predator fish. There are plenty of freshwater fish that live off plants and make for good food. To breed them, there's no need for the sea. There's no need even for a pond or river. The Dutch food company Fission Anova breeds a special kind of fish in enclosed halls. It's called clares and is especially well suited to aquaculture. The fish are unaggressive and can be farmed in dense populations. They grow quickly and have very efficient metabolisms. It takes just 700 grams of feed to produce a kilo of clares. A kilo of chicken requires five times as much feed. 70% of the feed is derived from plants, 30% is fish meal. Clarets are not purely herbivore, they're omnivores. To stay healthy, there must be some fish in their food. But they need far less than predator fish. To produce a kilo of salmon, you need two to three kilos of wild fish. It takes far less to raise a clarets to maturity. So clarets farming produces more fish than it consumes, not the other way around. This is why biologists give top environmental marks to largely herbivore freshwater fish farms. Of course, uh, sustainability is important because we want to make a good product, but also important because uh, for the market, uh, people are more and more aware of uh, that it's important not to, to fish the sea empty. Of course, uh, you cannot, could not sell a fish that is not uh, very good just because it is sustainable. Uh, it's very important that uh, next to that, it's also a good product. A Clarets farm like this produces a thousand tons of fish per year. High performance centers like this can take some of the burden off the oceans because they don't involve breeding predator fish. But there are other forms of sustainable aquaculture too. Organic aquaculture is less intensive. It can produce fish, but shrimp or prawns can also be farmed. The shrimp farm Biocentinella produces western white shrimps. They live in brackwater in river deltas, where the salt water mingles with fresh water. of this farm, Javier Barragan, switched to organic aquaculture 10 years ago, but not entirely of his own free will. In the year 2000-2001, uh, uh, we had a, a very devastating disease for shrimp, which is the white spot. The tendency at that moment was to increase the use of, of antibiotics to tried to do something about it, but it was worse. So I said, we will not give any more chemicals or antibiotics, even if I go broke, but it's no sense to do that. And amazingly, nothing happened. The mortality didn't increase, it uh, stopped. And then a company from UK said, well, I want to buy your product under the organic principle. And I said, yeah, okay, how much? All your products. 
Barrigan's farm has been certified as an organic and fair trade operation since 2002. That means he has to observe strict guidelines. Every year, an inspector comes to make sure he has stayed within the rules. Feed is an especially important factor in sustainability. The main ingredient is grain, but organic shrimp can't get by without some fish meal in their diet. It makes up about 30% of the feed. But organic fish meal is made purely of fish waste. For example, leftovers from fillet production. Not a single extra wild fish has to die for this feed. Organic farms like this are less productive. Barrigan's farm produces 600 kilos of shrimp per hectare of pond, about half of what a conventional farm produces. The prices paid for organic produce are higher, but not high enough to make up the difference in profit. Organic uh, principles and concepts is more expensive, is, but I never look after that. I love this, I, I feel this is good, and that is the most rewarding thing for me. Ecological, sustainable aquaculture like this really can take some of the burden off the oceans. But it can't satisfy the world's appetite for fish. Ecologists and ecologists are agreed that the oceans still contain enough fish to give humankind what it wants and needs. But we must start being more careful with this valuable marine resource. Examples to be found all over the world of how a moderate approach can pay off. One example is the cod stocks in the eastern Baltic Sea. Biologists from the Institute for Baltic Sea Fisheries have been monitoring them for years. Back in 2005, cod stocks were at a low ebb. The quotas were set much too high, much higher than scientists recommended. And then about 35 to 45 percent more cod was fished than legally permitted. Polish fisheries were largely responsible, and the Polish government turned a blind eye. That didn't change until the government changed in Poland. From 2007 onwards, the EU-friendly Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk saw to it that the quotas were respected. Since then, the cod stocks have recovered. They reached their historical low point in 2005 at about 60,000 tonnes. Now, just six years later, researchers estimate them at over 400,000 tonnes, more than six times as much. Christopher Zimmerman and his colleagues closely monitor the Baltic cod stocks. It's vital not to miss this opportunity to let them recover. Of course, there's always a danger that if the stocks recover quickly, the fisheries lobby will be quick to demand higher quotas. And that is very much the case here. Luckily for the cod stocks, we were able to implement a management plan in 2007, and this management plan contains what we call a stability clause. That means quotas may not be raised as quickly as the stocks recover, that they can only increase by 15 percent over the previous year's quota. That ensures that quotas only rise moderately and that stocks have a real chance to recover. And we can see the results. The stocks are doing well. Since 
So, sometimes sensible quota policies are enough to ensure that fisheries are sustainable. But for all the world's oceans to recover, radical reforms must be implemented in fisheries management. The cod trawler, Kristen Bettina, is leading the way. The fishermen on board are under constant supervision. Four cameras monitor what happens to the fish from the moment it is caught to the moment it enters the cool room. The goal is to somehow get the bycatch problem under control. We fishermen or captains are accused of doing illegal things all the time. So we said, let's install some cameras and subject ourselves to round-the-clock monitoring. And then nobody can accuse us of catching or throwing away small fish or the like. We replace the hard drive every four weeks and make the old one available to the authorities for inspection. The data are analysed at the Institute for Baltic Sea Fisheries in Rostock, where Germany's pilot study on supervised fisheries is based. Christopher Zimmermann is in charge of the programme. The video system covers every catch from start to finish. It also records the exact location and speed of the fishing vessel. That makes it possible to establish precisely where and when the catch was made. The cameras record what the fishermen haul in and the bycatch that they throw back overboard. In return, fishermen could look forward to fewer rules and regulations, to being able to fish freely but responsibly. The overall goal is to reduce bycatch to a minimum. Bycatch is one of the most essential problems in EU waters, largely because it's not covered by quotas. In other words, it's up to the fisherman how much he throws back overboard. We have to get away from this. We have to regulate the total amount of fish caught. We have to regulate how much of the stocks are fished, regardless of whether the fish ends up on our plates or goes back into the sea. Zimmermann says throwing away bycatch should be the same as throwing away money, an incentive to fishermen to keep their bycatch to a minimum. It can only work if we reverse the burden of proof. We can't leave it to the courts to find a fisherman guilty of breaking the law. We have to make the fishermen prove that they're acting within the law, that they're harvesting resources that belong to all of us in a responsible fashion. But this proposal is controversial. Opponents argue that it infringes on the fishermen's rights. The fisheries lobby likes to compare the proposal with cashiers who are filmed at work. But the difference is that the cashiers are not minding common property. In this case, the fish belongs to all of us, and fishermen are exploiting it free of charge. We allow fishermen to exploit this resource, but it's still our resource. If we carry that argument over to the cashier, it would be like being allowed to take everything out of the shop without paying for it, and all the cameras would do is document the missing stock for the accounting department, and nobody would be punished. The crew of the Kristen Bettina keeps its bycatch to a minimum. The meshes are bigger than required by law and the nets are equipped with what are known as barcoma exit windows. The barcoma mesh is square shaped and remains open even when the net is full. That means a smaller cod or other type of fish has a chance to get out. There are many ways for a fisherman to restrict his catch to the kind of fish that he can actually sell. But at the moment, it just doesn't pay. It might even cost more money. The way fisheries are currently regulated is diametrically opposed to sustainability. The only way to make fisheries sustainable is radical change. Boris Wurm and his colleagues have shown that several different measures have to be adopted at the same time more selective fishing techniques, smaller fleets, seasonal protection and protection zones. If the oceans are to avoid depletion, fishing pressure has to be reduced. Fishing pressure is defined as the amount of fish killed measured against the amount of fish in the sea. That doesn't mean there has to be less to go around. 
To understand the effects of fisheries, we have to explain the connections between the amounts caught, fishing pressure, and the effects on ecosystems. You can look at it like this. Fishing pressure can range from 0 to 100 percent. At the moment, fishing pressure is growing. Catches grow at first, then reach their ideal point, but then fall again because the fish stocks collapse. At the same time, the ecosystem loses biomass, and the average size of the fish shrinks. In other words, there are fewer fish, they are smaller, and the most important aspect in terms of conservation is that the number of collapsing fish stocks is increasing rapidly. That's where we are today. In other words, we are overfishing the oceans. We fall short of the ideal level and a large amount of fish stocks have already collapsed. Our proposal is to try to maintain the size of the catch while cutting the fishing pressure by half to the point where we can still harvest the same amount, but the collateral damage to the environment is much less significant. Most regions are here in this area at the moment. This is where we are, this is where we want to be. And that's the path fisheries management has to take on a global level. So today is a watershed moment. The oceans are endangered, but there is still a chance. A chance for fish stocks to recover to the extent that they yield enough for everybody. A chance for ecosystems to flourish again. A chance for the wealth of the oceans to grow again instead of dwindling away. If only humankind would finally begin catching only the fish we really want to eat. <laughs>